Okay, so um, hello everyone and welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions World Citizens Book Club. Today is Saturday the 13th of July and I'm your moderator, James May. I'm a program officer at CGS. Um, I'm pleased to see uh, all of you here today. Welcome. If anyone's joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. Uh, Drea is monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to her uh, or place questions in the general chat. Uh, today, we begin with a new book, Unraveled, A Personal Journey into Conflict, War and Diplomacy by Dr. Emma Onsong, um, who joins us today. Um, today is the first of two sessions with Emma's book. Um, I'll come back to Emma soon after a little housekeeping. Um, we're recording today's session. The video will be available on CGS's YouTube channel by mid next week. To ensure there is enough time for everyone to ask questions, I'm going to set a community agreement and ask you to keep um, your questions and comments to just two minutes. If you exceed that time, I will interject and ask you to wrap up so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. I'm also going to ask you to limit yourself to just one question or comment per person. Um, as I said, we want everyone to have an opportunity to speak with uh, Emma. Does anyone object to our community agreement? No, nope. great. Okay. So the schedule of today's session will be similar to our usual setup. Uh, Ember will kick us off uh, with her thoughts um, on the chapters covered by today's session. We will then open up for discussion at about 12.30. You can raise your hands virtually or physically or put your questions in the chat and we'll come to you on a first served, uh, first come first served basis. We'll stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. That's about 120 for you to uh, make any announcements um, about other events or uh, things you'd like to promote. Um, please hold comments that are off the topic of the book until the end of the session. I'll now hand over to CGS Executive Director, uh, Rebecca Shoot, uh, who will share with us how she met today's author, Emma, uh, Dr. Emma Onsong. Rebecca. Thank you so much, James, and thank you. I'm so delighted to see such a great turnout on this Saturday um, because I cannot imagine a more powerful and timely author and book with which to engage than Demi uh, Dr. Emma Asong and her book Unraveled. Um, Dr. Asong and I first met last year at the Assembly of States Parties to the International Criminal Court. The ASP is the governing body of the uh, ICC. And every year there are side events convened by non-governmental organizations. And CGS was very privileged to co-host a side event with Africa Legal Aid, Al Haq, Atrocities Watch Africa, and Human Rights Watch on um, reckoning with double standards, the future of the Rome statute system. And that side event probed how while the International Criminal Court, as with in other international judicial institutions, and more on that later with our plugs at the end of the program, um, has been successful in achieving an end to impunity in certain situations, uh, the promise of accountability remains illusory in so many circumstances. And um, Dr. Asong's powerful words at that event um, inspired me to pick up her book, and I'm so delighted that I've now been able to hopefully share that with the CGS friends and family gathered here today. So Emma, it is a real delight to have you with us, and thank you so much for sharing your story and your time. Um, back to you, James. Thank you, Rebecca. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest author for today. Um, Emma is the founder of Women, uh, Women for Permanent Peace and Justice and an engineer in the aerospace and aviation systems industry. She's the author of today's book, Unraveled, A Personal Journey into Conflict, War and Diplomacy. Today is session one of Emma's book. And with that, I will hand over to Emma uh, to begin her discussion. Welcome, Emma. Uh, please unmute. Thank you, James, for those very kind words. And to you, uh, Rebecca, thank you so much. Andrea, for the um, kind words that you've shared this afternoon about me. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that um, this is a real high privilege for me, a very humbling experience. Um, often writing is a very lonely journey. And so for an author, the greatest gift you can offer an author is the gift of recognition, if not the gift of um, commenting and moreover reading uh, the book. So it's indeed a privilege and an honor to be amongst uh, 
friends of uh, global citizens, um, citizens for global change this afternoon. So uh, let me start by saying that every time I'm asked to talk about my book, um, I, I struggle with how to start up and a torrent of competing headlines always comes to mind because there's so much to speak around the, the issue of conflict around the world. So I am left often feeling as though I may not do a great job. So the best place for me to start today, um, which is an unusual one for me, is uh, a quote from 2 Corinthians that says, we are always courageous. Depending on the version that you read, it states we are always confident and we walk by faith, not by sight. So my book is really a sum total of the, the, the faith that I have in dealing with um, my daughter's challenge, health challenges. And even more importantly, the faith I, I relied on in stepping into what is today the, the, the justice advocacy work that I do around uh, uh, conflict and crisis in the world. So in an attempt to take us uh, in the time that I have and engage all of you in conversation, I thought that I achieve, I try and achieve three things this afternoon. One is to share the motivation behind writing Unravel, a personal journey into conflict, war, and diplomacy. And the second thing I hope to achieve this uh, afternoon is what I call to engage in an inspectional read with you um, of my book. And lastly, I am really, really hoping we can engage in a conversation about what justice means for all, all of us. And so with that, what was the motivation for me in writing Unravel? I say it's really an introspective personal journey into my own life and the lives of so many around me involved in conflict on a very personal and existential level. The second motivation as I think through it was that I wanted to take a stand against peace. I know that's controversial, right? I wanted to confront the issue of peace and to promote justice. And here's a good point for me to talk a little bit about peace. You see, peace in the construct of the country called Cameroon has mainly been a way of manipulation and lies. And we know in falsehood, there is really rarely any peace. I, I say peace is often achieved through a concept of getting people to pray their problems into submission. And we have a duty to tell the next generation, to tell our children how we came to be called citizens of a particular country. In our case, uh, citizens of the Republic of Cameroon. Um, you see, for decades, the country has insisted on mandating our ignorance in insisting that we rely and, and stay in the noise of grievance and to avoid the hard work associated with really truly working for peace. So one of my motivation in telling my story was to take a stance, yes, controversial as it sounds, against peace, rather for justice. Um, to conclude my motivation in writing Unravel, it's really that in the heart of Unravel lies a deep-seated conflict to have control over our lives, and a deep-seated conflict that desires resolution. So that's how I came to this hard journey, a lonely journey of writing. And now, um, as to attempting an inspection I'll read of Unravel, permit me to tell you two stories. The first one is fictional, and the second one is not. Uh, in a book, uh, called, I think, The Other Bridgerton Girl. It's a classic 18th century book. I, I know most people don't read uh, those kinds of books, but I do. Captain James is forced to take Poppy on board his ship called Admiral on a 15 day journey bound from England to Portugal. You see, Poppy is a brilliant, intelligent, adventurous young girl who wanders away from her chaperone and finds herself in a cave where 
uh, pirates hide their loot. She is bounded, gagged, and dragged upon the Admiral. And shortly thereafter, Captain James realizes that Poppy is a distant cousin. And so Stockholm Syndrome is alive and well. And soon a kind of friendship develops. Captain James just can't kill the poor girl and throw her overboard, of course. So in one conversation, Captain James is telling this young girl about men building things that can with wings that can fly. The bright eyed girl says, this is preposterous. How come she's never heard anything so far fetching as men building things that can fly? To which the captain quickly says, but did you ever ask anyone? Poppy snap, snaps back, of course not. The captain says, then you can't complain about not knowing about these things. Poppy responds to him by stating, because I did not know to ask. You see, one needs a certain base knowledge to be able to ask sensible questions. It goes without saying, Poppy snaps back. I never as a young girl was given the opportunity to study physics. I tell this story, friends, to say that we were never given the opportunity to learn how we came to be called citizens of Cameroon or Cameroonians. So that's my first story. The second story I'd like to tell you is a little bit more of a personal nature on how I came to be called an American of Southern Cameroon's descent. And yes, most of you are going, where in the map is Southern Cameroon's? You see, in the early 80s, there was some exciting news going throughout my family. My brother-in-law and family, and my sister had just been uh, posted as diplomat to Washington, D.C. I had just graduated high school and quickly and had to travel hundreds of miles to the only French university in the capital city of Yaoundé in Cameroon. And I was quickly failing my way in the first semester, unable to speak the language with no remedial courses to help an indigenous, quote, anglophone girl in that university. You see, I was picked up by my bootstrap and brought into this country where I have lived for these past years. And then one day I woke up and the flag I had carried and the anthem I had sung were not that of my birth country. I would soon and quickly learn my history through the fog of war at the same time as I cradled my 24 year old who was now as a two month old in my hands in the hospital, unable to move from the neck down. You see, in that moment, I got to the place where I had to stand up, not only for my daughter, but at the same time for a country I knew that had now devolved into war. And so, I tell this story to say, I am Emma, an American of Southern Cameroon's descent. And with that, friends, when I wrote Unravel, in the introduction, and now for the inspection I'll read, in the introduction uh, of Unravel is perhaps the most difficult chapter I ever have written and perhaps will write. It began as an effort at journaling as I struggle with an insurance company that told my daughter, that denied her life-saving medication and told her to go home and die or to go home and languish in a nursing home. So I would let the readers um, tease out for themselves what they wish in, in the introductory uh, to unravel and no questions are out of bounds. Moving right along, and I know we have a short time and I wanna leave more time for discussion rather than my monologue. In chapter one, uh, titled Imaginary Nation Twice Born, I began this chapter uh, speaking about the, what I call the stubborn facts that laid buried yet unbroken of a country that is willing to maintain that false falsehood even at the barrel of the gun. And today, what is an eight year war in the quote, Anglophones, Northwest, Western, uh, all these different parts of um, the uh, Southern Cameroons. So in chapter one, 
I, I describe this concept of cognitive dissonance, right? The internal conflict I am now experiencing, as I mentioned earlier, of the flag I carried and the anthem I sang that all of a sudden I go, whose country? And it, it is in this chapter that I begin to talk about the colonial architecture and the colonial agenda uh, that uses this concept of a ratio um, that is really a well-worn tool for oppressive regimes and colonial regimes. So um, here is perhaps a good point to do what I call an inspectional read of um, of Unravel. So I'll take you, if you do have the book, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to page 42. And for those who have not read it, uh, this might give you a sense of um, what I discuss in the book. On page 42, uh, the second paragraph, I write, when I think about introducing the country I call for decade as my country of birth, I am slammed with churning vocabulary, disjointed, dissonance, confusion. I am not sure how to tell a story that's unfinished, whose murkiness inflames a deep desire for resolution, for others, a cunning for continued deception. It's difficult to pinpoint what the story is when I'm only recently awoken to all its conflicts, its contradictions, its inconveniences and whitewash, and sometimes its differences without distinction. And now it's war, a war in full gear just steps outside of my childhood home. What am I to make of this? Um, I, I also reflected on this section um, to share with you on page 47 to give you a sense of what that first chapter um, is all about. At uh, the bottom of page 47, I continued. The history of the construct called Cameroon, a peaceful bastion in an Africa rife with war, a miniature Africa is a whitewash history a history of convenience. Stories of one and indivisible, Cameroon are touted, but no one tells you that Cameroon, an Africa Union member state, ratified the Africa Union Constitutive Act on invaluabilities of borders and the UN on territoriality. Um, so to conclude on, on chapter um, one of Unravel, um, and this idea of a stateless spirit and dissonance, I shared that I was taught Napoleonic history. The stories that shaped the contours of my life, concealed, reinvented, and repackaged as Africa's miniature. First, I sang the anthem under the green, red, and yellow flag adorned with two stars. Later, I was told to sing the same anthem, except this time adorned with one flag. Each time an edict came from those who do not see my scars, nor hear my cries, nor those of my fathers too. It always felt as though a big brother had his fingers firmly pressed down our backs. I'm gonna end here. Uh, uh, and continue with uh, a few reflections on this. It's perhaps a good place um, to talk about this issue of what really is causing the eight year war in Cameroon. Many will tell you that it's a problem of marginalization of quote, the Anglophone population, that it's a problem of poor governance, that's a um, problem of cultural anxieties or linguistic and legal differences. They will not be far from the truth. However, those are not the root causes. Um, in the interest of time, what I would not do is go back to um, uh, the time of independence to kind of sequence the history of how Cameroon 
came to be what it is today, from the League of Nations to the Trust Territories, uh, to independence of the Republic of Cameroon in 1960, and the plebiscite of um, February 11 that allowed the former British Southern Cameroons to do to have two only two options. I will deal with that a little bit uh, as we go along. Um, I end this chapter um, with a few call to actions, and we'll talk about that in the second session. But one thing I wanted us to um, contemplate here is really the, the, the concept of the colonial agenda in Africa and how it, it shaped much of our lives and continue to do so till today. Um, and so I'll move along in chapter two of Unravel, titled The Church. This is the shortest chapter in the book and somewhat of an anomaly. It's a short chapter, but an important one. Why? Because here I begin to talk about the tools of the colonial project and, and, and in this case, the use of religion, right? So we are a heavily proselytized people, prone to praying our problems into submission and avoiding the hard work of conflict resolution. Everything is to be surrendered to God. God will take care of it. We must pray harder when problems arrive and literally pray the devil back to hell. So in this chapter, I, I use the church much as a microcosm of the larger society where there's an ongoing conflict that's threatening to break up the church. Much like the larger population, there are always ongoing conflicts threatening to erupt on the surface, but being held down by a repressive regime. So no one wants war within this concept of the church. Everyone prays for peace. Everybody wants and covers peace, but everybody remains neutral, right? Much again, like the larger population who beleaguered just want to get on with their lives. So um, this chapter is really inviting us not to overlook Christianity's role in laying a vast swath of humanity, particularly in Africa, praying their problems into submission and, the, and supplanting the local religions that for decades and hundreds of years have empowered people as problem-solving, self-reliant and creative persons. Um, I would also, in later chapters, um, I talk about the central role uh, Christianity had in educating young minds and even mine, right, going into a convent school, um, and, and also how the atmosphere at the dawn of independence by joining, I'll talk a little bit about that, was that of fear, submission, uh, criminality, and, and um, other things. So uh, I'll leave chapter two at that um, uh, for the reader to appraise ap further and go into chapter three, where I titled it, Is Conflict in Our DNA? I really did enjoy writing this chapter. It's probably one of the chapters I, 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 I took a little fun and creative um, literacy with it. It offered me the opportunities, uh, opportunity to relieve the contours of my life again, as seen through that colonial lens and conflict. Uh, and, and, and as I was growing up, this, this architecture was taking shape and the agenda was gradually being implemented. Um, the best way for me to look at this chapter, right, is to say that no one doubts the cleansing power of fire, but no one wants to be in hell anyway. A little bit of fire tends to be purifying and cleansing, much like baptism by fire, where um, it has an initiating force that propels and engenders one to take action based consistent with one's value. But when fire persists, 
it loses all its purifying fire of, of power and becomes a destructive force. In this chapter, I'm trying to say that the construct that I understand as Cameroon is quintessentially a violent country. Although it's described kind of funly as Africa in miniature and for intents and purposes, uh, of the eight geographical regions in, in, in Africa, Cameroon, I think, boasts five of them, the savanna, the Sahel, the rainforest, the highlands, and so forth. But this is one of the countries, if we look at statistics, that say 72% of the global population lives under dictatorship. Cameroon is one of those. Having boasted only two presidents since independence, one, a president for 42 years and counting, and today presiding over an eight year war that has been described by some as genocidal. And so um, in chapter two, uh, chapter three rather, I talk about the convent years quite funnily, <laughs> but again, within this construct of conflictual systems of uh, conflict that are taking root, I talk about the country in the post-independence uh, era, educating good, great wives of tomorrow, um, and how I came to discover teamwork. Um, one of the things that I, I want to share with you here is um, I took some creative liberty to situate um, uh, the fact that at this point, as quote, the Southern Cameroons had join uh, the already dependent, independent uh, Republic of Cameroon as, as uh, two states of equal status, an elite class was gradually being formed, made up of governors, educators, security forces, and the religious. And I talk a little bit about my own role there through my, my father, who was an administrator, uh, a, a senior district officer, uh, in a part called Fontem, which is today one of the hardest hit areas of the war. Uh, by some estimation, it's a no-go zone of, for the military forces. You see, my, my father represented this class of the new elite. However, my father was acu acu acutely aware that the February 11 plebiscite where people went to the polls in 1961 to vote whether to join the already independent Republic of Cameroon was the proverbial burning in hell or the option for British Southern Cameroonians to vote to join as part and be integrated as a state into the already independent Republic of Nigeria as the proverbial drowning in the blue sea. You see, my father wanted outright independence. And so for him, even though having to work under that system, he, uh, he preferred to align himself with the local chiefs and the local populations. And rather than take the edicts that came out from Yaoundé, he opted to do uh, work with the local population. And for that, his, his career and reputation would suffer. I think this is a good point, um, uh, friends, uh, to do a short read, if you don't mind. Um, and I'll go to page 82. If you have the book, you can follow. Uh, if you don't, it, that is okay also. So in this chapter, I write, a two-class system evolved and quickly took root in the culture of the school as quickly as it did in the country. In now declassified documents, France, through its diplomatic mission in Yaoundé and a consular office in the state of West Cameroon in Boya, traded off on how best to assimilate the English speaking Cameroonians. A select number of our parents will be groomed not only to speak French, but also to fully integrate them into the Napoleonic way of governance. They took up mostly junior positions in the Francophone system. Compared to their yet to be assimilated brothers, they were affluent and part of the bourgeoisie class. 
if their children knew of this, it was not yet apparent, for they too will be tied to the same destiny as the people. Uh, I hope that gives you a flavor of what I, I was trying to co um, convey there. Um, so in this chapter, there's a concept of the college years also being the laboratory for brainwashing uh, as it was to feign an education uh, for a future generation whose choices in gainful employment, particularly as women, were far and few in between. Um, and so I would, I would share in my book um, on page 86 that what we embodied in discipline and wholesome Catholic values, we lacked in conflict and greed and dogged curiosity. And that was all we needed to become perfectly educated perpetrators of spoon-fed lies. Um, there's a lot here that I'd like to share, um, but it probably suffices that I, uh, for this chapter, I end with this section on page 92. For us, it was our, our education, our legal system, the judiciary, and the religious structures designed to give us just enough knowledge to be considered educated, just enough freedoms and rights to believe we were free, just enough resources to thrive, and a healthy dose of religiosity to keep us heaven bound. And to forget we were disenfranchised, poor, frightened, and malleable, but mostly hoping it would be better. I ended this chapter with uh, uh, a few fallacies. Uh, one that I would like to share here, there are others, is this concept of tokenism. And we see that at play today where in the construct called Cameroon, uh, this, the, the, the Anglophones uh, are the proverbial girl that is always taken to a dance but never asked to dance. And therefore you have the president and always an Anglophone a, a prime minister with, with um, absolutely very little power. Uh, so this concept of tokenism is alive and well keeping the people often malleable. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way, Drea? Just fine. I mean, if you if you wrap up in the next, you know, six, seven minutes, we still have plenty of time for a discussion. Sounds great. Okay. So I have two, two more chapters to cover. As briefly in summary, chapter four is this concept of how happiness masks deep fissures within the, the larger uh, society. Uh, and 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 how we always develop creative ways of getting ourselves off the hook. Today we see young youths, uh, youths in Kenya, standing up for themselves as opposed to staying in the grievance, in in, in the gr in grievance, staying in the rhetoric uh, of of um, what the regime tells us and divisive re rhetoric. So um, this is a chapter where I call the reader to take on. Um, a bit uh, of a reflective stance on how they see uh, the dark side of uh, toxic positivity. I'll leave uh, chapter four at that. Uh, and chapter five, winds of nationalism, ignoring it at your peril. Uh, I say that we can only bend the contours of truth. We can never actually bend the truth. This is a chapter where I begin to talk about the immediate cause or causes of the eight-year war in southern Cameroons um, and what has today been called the Ambazonia Separatist War of Independence. Um, let me quickly say this because I think it's important and then I'll wrap up. Imagine a sea of humanity, right, of the kind that came out when George Floyd was killed in the United States for those who followed those events. Now imagine that the government of the United States asked the military to come out with gunship helicopters and start shooting at peaceful protesters. 
that singular act would shock the consciences of the entire world and there would be wall-to-wall -wall global coverage of the, of the killings. These were the scenes that occurred in 2017 as peaceful protesters came out with peace plans in hand and the, the president ordered gunship helicopters to come out. When the crowds were finally disp dispersed, many lay die, dead on the streets. Hundreds were hurled, hurled away to distant torture centers and jails in French Cameroon. Hundreds more were disappeared. And those who survived, survived many young boys, melted into the forest and today form what is called the Amber Boys or the Armed Separatist Groups. The year again was um, uh, 2017. And on November 30th of that year, President Bia declared war on what he calls terrorists intending to destroy his country. That is one and indivisible. Al Jazeera and a few other outlets like Voice of America would carry little snippets of the, of the demonstrations but there will be nothing else in the world that's going on. There will be no um, resolution passed in any of the international organs calling for the violation of civil of people's civil rights and human rights. There will be no um, conferences, but for one uh, called the Aria Formula Conference of 2019 on the humanitarian crisis that, we, that was largely unfolding at which time Norwegian Refugee Council described the crisis as the world's most neglected and most in need of humanitarian aid. Um, I wanted to uh, read very quickly and then I will end uh, page 133. <clears throat> Title striking against the monster. When resolution from a conference in May 15 in Nozo, that is the new word for Northwest and Southwest, in the town of Bamenda, and on February 16 in Boyer for corrective measures sent to the Cameroonian uh, Common Law Bar Association went unheeded by President Bia in October 2016, the lawyers called for indefinite sit in strike and boycott the court attendance. By the end of 2016, other groups joined in the protest. The leaders of the Anglophone Teachers Union, tradesmen joined the lawyers to devise a response to the government. Uh, I'm doing some speed reading now. In the weeks to come, hundreds of thousands of young men and women poured out on the streets and joined in a non-violent revolution. Africa in miniature, touted as a bastion of peace, had eventually erupted. The people stood up and took one step and then another in the streets throughout Bia's Nozo. In Bamenda, that's my hometown, thousands marched up station to the governor's residence. It was from my daughter's bedside at Johns Hopkins that I consumed these images, some too horrid to see. It was here that my own internal revolution would begin, ultimately leading me to step up and to accept my own role in the unfolding conflict. But first I had to acknowledge I did not know much. I would have to go back to 1884, back to when there was a German Cameroon to learn my own history. But that too would not be enough as history is in the making and for the construct called Cameroon, it is changing fast in front of our very eyes. Um, okay. I would not go in details. I think we are ending this session today in chapter six, differences without distinction. Uh, summarizing uh, it to say that this is the chapter where I begin to offer a thumbnail sketch of the entire history from 1916 to present. And I, on, if you take nothing else from this chapter is the fact that uh, Cameroon, the Republic of Cameroon on April 1961 became the 116th member state of the United Nation without the territory called Southern Cameroons. 
it also undertook uh, to upheld the uh, Cairo Agreement uh, that, uh, that says, that is the Africa Constitutive Act that says, borders are invaluable, borders achieved at independence are invaluable and immutable. That's Article 4B. So let me end here uh, by saying that this is a first of two sessions. I believe the second session comes up August 2nd, if I'm not wrong. And in the upcoming session, I hope you would join me as we look at the sobering peace and architecture uh, environment and the peace and security environment in a world that is fast becoming um, rather more conflict prone than not. I will attempt in the second session, friends, to discuss failed attempts at brokering peace in the eight year war in my birth country. And also we'll look at the inadequacy of the, of the legal framework within the country called Cameroon to punish international crimes. And, and finally, um, the complex set of actors, the proxies, uh, by this I mean countries like France that have largely had their thumbprint and their fingers in their former colonies and have never left, the internal fragmentation and, and uh, what we can all do uh, to, to help the situation. And with that, I will stop. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Emma. That was a, a deeply personal and reflective um, account of your personal experiences and a critical analysis of colonial legacies in Cameroon and um, insight into the ignored oppression of Cameroonians and in Cameroon. Um, I would now like to open the floor up to questions. Um, you can raise your hand virtually. I see one already um, or physically if you uh, would prefer to do it that way. You can also put questions in the chat box, um, which Drea will monitor and flag. Um, that will come to you on a first come, first serve basis. And as I said before, please try to keep your questions ideally or comments to two minutes so that Emma has good time to respond. Um, with that, uh, first on my screen uh, with a question is Gail. Gail, would you like to... Uh, come in. Yes. Um, well, I'm really thrilled that we are discussing this book, Emma, because um, we don't, we in the U.S. don't know much about the global north versus global south. You know, we don't hear the perspectives of the global south. We don't realize that a lot of times, you know, our ideas about things might be 180 degrees different than those of you in the global south. And it was intriguing to me, especially I've spent four years in Africa and I never heard about the war in Cameroon. And I, th I thought, well, that's interesting. Why haven't we gotten any news about it? Um, I, I like that you discussed some of the tools of oppression because we need to really understand those. And, um, you know, before we can tackle them, things like you, you talked about language and wording, uh, the word, um, the uh, trusteeship or a, a trust territory implies that the trustee is to be trusted because it was designated to do to do that by the United Nations. You know, so it, it, those kinds of implications, that's one good example, I think, that you mentioned in passing. Um, but I'm wondering if you have, well, the, I'm wondering what the role is of the U.S. because this is, ver you know, the um, when countries got their independence from colonialism, the colonialism was up front and very visible. You know where uh, the colonial countries physically ran the colonized countries, but when they got independence, they got political independence, but not not economic independence, and that's the neo, the new form of colonization. And that's much more silent. I mean, it's hard to, to see it. And that's why the tools of oppression, it's important to know those. So oftentimes um, these, these tools are, you know, we're told to, um, to help to either, um, you know, to help protect some uh, country or group within a country, 
or to spread democracy. You know, it's always cloaked now in humanitarian terms instead of brazen colonial terms. And I'm wondering, well, the U.S. has joined the ex-colonizers, the former colonizers in doing this around the world, even though the U.S. was not, you know, an imperial colonial power in that, you know, in that era. But it is now taken on that role. And I'm wondering what role the U.S. has in the war in Cameroon. Thank you, Gail. Emma? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, first, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that you're, you're very correct when you say that uh, countries in Africa did get political, political, but not economic independence to an extent. Uh, and differ with you uh, greatly, particularly in a country called Cameroon, uh, the Republic of Cameroon, and by extension, the independence that was given to British Southern Cameroon to join the already independent country called Cameroon as a state of equal status, that neither of them, right? Uh, the French never left. So politically, Cameroon was not quite independent. In theory, it was, but France was, in fact, um, left its leaders on there as proxies to the French um, entrance. So even at the economic level, they did not. Uh, you must have heard, Gail, of this um, a thing called the Cooperation Agreement. This is really indeed a, a thing where the former colonial master uh, in exchange for granting independence to Cameroon, said you must agree to these terms of which were um, uh, security conditions, economic conditions where, and physical conditions, right? Where their, their uh, reserves, monetary reserves are being deposited in the Bank of Paris, in the central bank in exchange for parity. Uh, where uh, the country signs that in event of uh, a foreign aggression or internal aggression, uh, France, essentially through its ambassador, can take actions for uh, a country. So you are right in that uh, these countries really never got economic uh, independence. But I, I argue strongly that many never really did get um, political independence as well. It was more theoretical than anything. In terms of the role of the US in, um, in, a, in the sub-Saharan scope, you're right that they really were not uh, uh, one of the colonial masters, but they, did, they, they do promote their own version of foreign policy there that can be argued um, depending on what point you enter the argument. For the United States, I've come to understand that my country of naturalizations uh, input into Africa is always, their playbook is along two very clear lines. One is to promote democracy. The second is to prom promote um, humanitarian efforts, right? And human rights. Now, they are willing to go to bed with dictators like the president of Cameroon uh, to the extent that um, the, the, the geopolitical arrangement is not upended, right? So while, while we are struggling currently with the exploitation of, of these countries by a certain multinational, uh, the US is not, it cannot be excused from that. In, in the context of Cameroon, I write that um, you have the Swiss there by way of Glencore, you have Russia by way of Loop Oil, you even have Scotland by way of Bol Bolivian, and of course France heavily embedded through all its subsidiaries and its colonial uh, agreements still fully in place. The America is also involved there uh, through uh, multinational corporations such as Exxon. Now that America is exploitative, I I would put them very low on the on the uh, I guess the um, uh, the scale. Uh, France ranks really high in terms of having never left the um, its former colonies. We see today uh, Burkina, Mali, Niger clearly and forcefully breaking away 
from uh, France hegemony in their areas. Cameroon is yet to do so. Uh, our currency is still tied uh, and uh, I guess guaranteed by the French with the reserves, 50% uh, of the reserve of the national um, treasury in Fr France um, bank accounts. That's not the case with the US. Now, I, I would also add that the US has been one of the few countries that has taken some concrete measures when the war broke out. They passed resolution 1684, condemning what was going on and actually naming France as a, a potential key player and calling them based on their influence in the country to ensure that the, the government of the Republic of Cameroon engages with the armed separatists in, in mediation without preconditions so as to address the root causes. They also in 2019 cut some um, uh, military aid to Cameroon to protest human rights abuses that were going on um, and, and have passed things like TPS, temporary protection status for people who are fleeing from Cameroon. So all of this has uh, goes to show some interest that the US has shown in the eight year war, but not enough again, because the US or any other country has not brought the war up to the UN Security Council much like that in Ukraine was brought, brought up. The same types of killings, which I didn't share in, in my earlier exchange, uh, uh, that, had occur that occurs in Ukraine are occurring in Cameroon. There are estimates of um, th upwards of 30,000 deaths, 500 villages raised to the ground. At the height of the war, more than a million people displaced into the Francophone region, many deported into Nigeria. And um, it was estimated at one point that eight out of every 10 school age child was out of school. Today, that number has come down some, but the, the degree of humanitarian um, disaster has not abated. Uh, so the U.S., in my opinion, can play uh, almost the same role it plays in Ukraine, in Israel, and in Syria in, in ending the war in Cameroon. But to date, it has not done uh, gone that far. Thank you, Emma. Um, Lee, would you like to go next? In the fourth chapter, you label, you describe what happened as there being two historically distinct cultures. And I've been wondering whether those the distinct cultures developed as a result of colonialism or were they there before then? Uh, please unmute, Emma. Thank you, Lee, for that question. The short answer, Lee, is that it developed as a result of colonialism. We, we are products of a legacy of colonialism. Recall that before, um, before um, Europeans came to the continent, um, there were indigenous cultures. Those cultures have largely been supp supplanted by the colonial um, uh, culture and that culture has taken the form of um, uh, the type of education system that exists in the British Southern Cameroon, which is today the Anglophone region, and the culture handed down by the Napoleonic um, invaders and trust, trust, trust um, territories from France. The uh, the legal systems are different. In the English speaking part, we practice what's called common law. Uh, on the French side of Cameroon, they practice what's called civil law. Uh, teachers teach in English in the English speaking part and French in the French speaking part. And to, to a large extent, the cultures that support those two are fundamentally different, right? Um, so on the surface, that itself, 
is a system rife with conflict. Because for I, I am not a student of law. Um, I studied engineering. But on surface, just the legal uh, experiment, the two really cannot coexist. Common law is a law based on precedence, um, a law where the judge is, is not, um, does not sit above the case, but rather uh, you are tried by a jury of your peers, right? In the civil law, it's a law based on a codified text. The, the magistrate or the judge um, can decide your fate without, without um, uh, even a trial. And, and so today we have um, a, a culture where our own indigenous cultures are largely um, not what is not what is practiced in 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 what I call in in the business of conducting uh, in governance. It's mainly uh, the legacies that we have inherited for having been first a League of Nations and later a trustee territory on the British and uh, on the Anglophone side and on the France in the French side of Cameroon. I hope that. Uh, clarified your question, Lee. Well, I really was thinking about 500 years ago. Were there different cultures then? Oh, wow. Uh, that's interesting. I, I So there were different culture in the sense that uh, uh, di different swaths of people, right? Like the Bantus, the Tikas, the people who have now migrated and are existing in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa had specific um, cultures. Uh, the French and English people uh, 500 years ago, I would argue, had some differences among them uh, from an indigenous perspective, right? Uh, Africa is a very diverse place when we, when we speak of cultures. Um, even from the place I come from, every four kilometers, uh, somebody does something different, culturally speaking, the way they speak, and even to the extent the way they, they dress. So 500 years ago, yes, there were different cultures. Now, where where the, they, these people existed in the map of what is today Cameroon, um, I haven't done that in-depth research, but you had people who today... Uh, some say migrated from the northeast of Africa into into what is today Cameroon and another migration from the south uh, with their own specificity. But 500 years later, uh, it, it's it's more uh, pockets of tribal cultures um, that outside the boundaries of Cameroon, no one really is very familiar with it except the indigenous. Thank you, Emma. Um, are there other questions? Would anybody like to flag a hand? Okay, well, in lieu of anybody else asking a question right now, I would like to ask, um, there seems to be incredible linguistic and ethnic diversity within both Anglophone and Francophone Cameroon. And how does the dynamic of the conflict between them and the oppression, political oppression by the current presidential and political system. How does that play out within this internal diversity? Are there coalitions within the population who are more or less bound up in the conflict? Um, and how does the political system manage that at the moment? Oh, wow. Uh, let me paraphrase just to make sure I understand the question. You're asking if uh, the uh, the linguistic diversity. I really like you to rephrase it because I okay. heard I heard three competing things. Okay, and I want so to be clear there is a there is a there is a clear conflict which you've described between the mm -hmm. Anglophone Cameroon and the Francophone Cameroon, the 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 historical independent Cameroon that is that that was uh, came together with the Southern Cameroons, and within those territories there is, as you've described, huge diversity. 
And does that diversity within the country contribute to or mitigate or uh, impact at all on this other conflict that you've described already? Does, ah. does the, the incredible, I mean, I was looking at a map of diversity of Cameroon and other parts of uh, Africa. It's astonishing. So mm -hmm. how does that play into this wider conflict that you've discussed, if at all? So, so the first thing I'd like to say is that the crisis currently is not, is not a linguistic crisis. It's not a cultural crisis per se, right? Um, it may have started. So the, the, the march that lit up the fire was really about teachers asking the government, please do not send French teachers into our schools who do not speak our language. And please do not send judges and lawyers into our courtrooms to judge our grandmothers who practice civil law and have no understanding of our jurisprudence. So on the surface, James, there is this literature out there that the cause of the war was uh, linguistic and cultural differences. That has its place in the context of minority grievances. One, could, one would argue that when the government failed to recognize the deep-seated adhesion, attachment of the Southern Cameroonians, Anglophones, or people from the Northwest, Southwest, to their uh, colonial traditions of um, Anglo-Saxon, uh, jurisprudence and Anglo-Saxon education, they erupted on the streets and protested and the government overreacted and started the war. At some point in the buildup of the war, the population said, we have come to a point, an inflection point, where we have now understood that your intent all along was to annex and assimilate us, hence wipe our cultural heritage and make us one and indivisible. And oh, by the way, we have now come to a full realization that we were not a uh, part of you. We were two states of equal status. And so there is a more full-throated demand for self-determination underway. And those cultural and linguistic anxieties are not really what is pushing the agenda for war, continued fighting by the armed separatists and the government. On, for the government's side, it's to ensure that there are no protests, there is no further demand as to the form of the state. For the armed groups, it is now a demand for the existence of what they call the Ambazonia state, which is an independent entity outside of the Republic of Cameroon as it achieved independence in 1960. So if you look at Cameroon as a country, that's why there's a chapter on toxic positivity. It's an attempt to say that um, between Cameroonians and their neighbors, they don't get up in the morning and say you're French and I'm English to the extent that it does not impede um, their, their upward mobility. R recall that the Anglophones are always treated as second class citizen. So there's, um, there's that anxiety already in the society. But amongst the, the civilians, um, there is no, there's no animosity against someone just because they are French. There's actually that degree of harmony, as I've said, that, that uh, um, excessive sense that we are at peace. Meanwhile, the fundamentals are far from peaceful, hence the fact that today we see the country on the brink. Now, if ever, ever, the youths are to behave as those in Kenya, I submit to you that Cameroon would not be uh, the Cameroon today because it has all the elements of um, 
of violence going on in, in its system. I, I hope, James, that clarifies uh, the linguistic diversity and, and the idea of forming coalition. While the French have not really joined the English to push their agenda, uh, recognizing that their grievances are based on historical facts, legal facts, it has not necessarily uh, put them at loggerheads, much like um, uh, one would imagine. I don't know if that clarifies. Uh, yeah, wonderfully interesting. Question. Thank you. Um, yeah. Rebecca, you've had your hand up for a while, so I'll come to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so um, my question is about wither justice, obviously, domestic institutions not being fit for purpose, not being concerned with um, an, an end to impunity for ongoing atrocity crimes. Can we look either to the local level, at the community level, traditional forms of dispute resolution and adjudication, um, for example, uh, similar to the Gashasa courts in, in Rwanda? Can we look to the global level, uh, noting that Cameroon is one of only two countries in Central Africa that is not a member of the International Criminal Court, the other being Equatorial Guinea, which is also the only a country with a longer sitting president than Cameroon's. I don't think this is a coincidence uh, necessarily. Um, and uh, where we are an organization that is concerned with global governance solutions, um, would there be um, effect to having uh, opportunities for representation beyond the domestic level within the confines of borders that were superimposed um, that we all recognize do not fit um, what the realities are. Um, we talk at the CGS about a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, for instance. Would this help give voice to, to people? Um, are there other uh, international options that, that you think uh, should be contemplated? Uh, and while we're speaking about the legislative, legislative branch, I think I saw last week that um, President Bia also extended the term of parliament again. So it will not uh, until maybe 2026 or something like that. So we there won't be parliamentary elections um, for I think it was eight years or, or something along those lines. So when we think about checks and balances, obviously this is incredibly concerning. What solutions and what hope is out there? Um, oh. That was a lot, <laughs> a lot of nested questions <laughs> and you'll have all the answers I know. Thank you so much, Emma. Oh, wow. That is a tall order. I, actually, it, it, it plays very well in what we will cover next uh, session. And um, oh, it, it's so much in there, Rebecca. Um, as I say, when, it, when, when the subject is Cameroon, my mind goes into a, a spin mode and, and I am not sure where my outlets are. But if one thing uh, the audience should know based on your uh, introductory remarks and question there is that Cameroon is, is moving into an election year, presidential, um, municipal, parliamentary, uh, regional elections, 2025. So I'm starting in the most controversial place for a purpose. The 42 year long serving president, President Paul Bia, is heading into his eighth mandate in 2027 and for all intents and purposes is a candidate for the now ruling party since the dawn of independence before Ahijo's UPC, uh, UNC party or UPC, no, UN, one Cameroon, CNU party. I get my acronym sometimes confused. And with that, um, one would argue, Rebecca, that a president that has sustained a war for eight years, has been in power for 42 years, um, is in alliance and in lockstep with his former uh, colonial master, France, who has veto power at the United Nations, whether he will be open for more um, alternative forms of dispute resolution. And that's why in the next section, we'll talk about the attempts at, at mediation and um, how, how those have fared. So in, in terms of um, whether there's opportunity for um, alternative forms of 
uh, resolutions to the conflict, particularly looking at the local level, traditional level. Yes, we're, we are a very traditional set of people, um, highly diverse. Um, the, 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 the chiefs have a role to play within the society that's highly respected. But here's the, 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 the caveat with that. In my opening discourse, I talked about an elite class that was groomed and has been groomed and continued to be groomed, who serve at the behest of one person. So even where, and, 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 and here I, I, I dare to talk about stuff that we'll talk about, which is that Cameroon really lacks the legislative framework and the legal framework to deal with international crimes domestically, even, even where the ICC allows this issue of complementarity. It, it, Cameroon just isn't up to it. And the reasons are very simple. There's no separation of power. Um, the, 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 the president holds the, the yam and the knife, so to speak. Uh, he appoints from the governors on down. So there's really no way uh, real truth, justice, and accountability for victims can, can be had in most cases. So while there are attempts like what has happened in uh, South uh, Sudan, um, where, uh, um, and even in Rwanda, where the local communities can, can, can get at the truth, get to reconciliation and get to reparation and some form of restitution. In the context of Cameroon, I submit to you that it will be done through, through, through the force of fear, the force of acquiescence, because of the big hand of the government over the people. Uh, there's a point in Unravel where I say Cameroon has traditionally been ruled through a series of decrees from independence, where um, the president can get up today and say, sur le haute instruction de, in other words, under the high authority of the president, I've declared so and so, and that's it, without benefit of debate at the legislature or without benefit of consultation at the local level. So, so Rebecca, the, uh, the the idea of these types of conversation is to get people like um, like Lee and Gail, who perhaps are coming into full awareness that, oh, there's Ukraine, there's Gaza, there's Syria, and then there's Southern Cameroon, and that there's a role for organizations such as Citizens for Global Solution to, to really um, look into how they can move the conversation um, away from this autocratic regime to begin to think how their, part, their international partners can come into play in ways that can change the trajectory of war and engage in what is called good faith dialogue that addresses the root causes. Because whether you take the problem into the local level, where the local level is answerable through its hierarchy to one person, you really never um, stop the violence. You just put a veneer over it. Hence the, the notion um, in the second session of this, uh, where I'll talk about things like special status, right? That That's that's another band-aid solution offered from the government down uh, as their way of solving the problem. So um, there is a place for these ADRs. Um, it has been shown to work in other conflicts. Um, one thing we need to recognize also is that is some of the areas where these types of uh, ADRs have worked, the communities have more homogeneity um, um, in terms of culture. Uh, the diversity of Cameroon and the deliberate attempt to keep us ever dividing ourselves into lower common denominator is also an act by those in power. As I said earlier, to keep us invested in the grievance of, of, of division rather in the hard work of, of justice. So the international options are clear. Where a domestic 
crisis becomes an international crisis. It moves the purview for resolution naturally gets moved into the international realm, which means it triggers those um, mechanisms for justice and accountability, except when it comes to sub-Saharan Africa, the playbook seems to be thrown out. So while Bucha in Ukraine occurs, this mass massacre, when it occurs in Garbo, there's silence. Whereas uh, when there's a clear humanitarian catastrophe, human rights abuses, um, a, a, a country perhaps with universal jurisdiction or a country might introduce the crisis and get it voted so that there can be an impartial investigation conducted and perpetrator held to account. When those crises occur, either it's ignored or something is done as we saw in the case of Rwanda when there's so many lives lost. So Rebecca, I'm not sure if um, it's, it, I, I have sufficiently responded to your comments and questions there, but I, I, see, I see that uh, global governance um, is something that we all should champion because in that case, we're literally saying that uh, we are all tied together and, uh, and our common humanity is, is at stake anywhere and everywhere it's threatened. Thank you, Emma. That was a wonderfully considered response. Um, so there's, we're coming to time, um, but Sam has had his hand up for a while, so I will come to Sam in just a second. Um, and I would like to bring everybody's attention to Edwin's comment um, in the chat. Uh, which is a rather long piece, so I won't read it out, but it's there for your consideration. Um, and he's also added a link um, which you can follow if you're interested. So Sam, um, if you'd like to uh, comment or speak, um, we're coming to the end of the session. So if you could keep it brief, thank you very much. I would much appreciate it. I'll keep it very brief. I really enjoyed uh, being part of this conversation. And I have not read the book, as I said at the top, but in looking at the internet, I saw that the foreword was written by PLO Lumumba. And I recalled Lumumba and I are the same age. We were at the University of Nairobi at the same time. He just took a much more public role in things and ran afoul of the Kenyan government. And so uh, I really admired his work from afar. Uh, study of law, practicing of justice, human rights. And so this book seemed to me really write up the kinds of things I want to be doing. I, I just make a comment that some of us are pursuing the same things in different ways. So my involvement has not been because of personally being imprisoned by the Kenyan government or suffering in any personal ways. I came to the United States to go to grad school and I thought, uh, what Emma you are saying about the fictions of African countries, uh, the ways in which you perpetuate those are by the way you describe the country. So Kenya is a fiction in the same way and other African countries are. The way society philosophy talks about these things was my preferred method of entering them. So I'm simply making the point that we are doing the same thing in very, very different ways. And I really appreciated hearing from somebody who is an engineer I don't think much of engineers. Uh, I think my, highly of this one uh, because what you're doing is actually fairly uh, along the lines of what uh, liberation needs. So again, thank you very much for the welcome and I'm gonna pick up the book and read it. So thank you very much. Thank you. So with that one convert um, and a new reader, hopefully uh, an order in the post. Um, I will now bring the uh, discussion to a close. If there are no further comments or questions, I don't believe there are. Um, with that, I will say um, to our author, Emma, thank you so much for your time and your considered responses. It's been a fantastic session. I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I have three pages of notes, which I will try to <laughs> digest afterwards. Um, I would like now to open up uh, the floor to any other comments on other business. Emma, just so you know, we this is a get together of some of our uh, members. 
Uh, so we like to use this opportunity just to exchange news if there is any. Um, so with that, is there anybody who'd like to flag anything, make any comments on other business or promote any events that you're involved in? I actually would like Rebecca to, to come back on and talk about, I think it's really relevant for our CGS events next week. And then I can put the links in the chat if anyone's interested. So Rebecca. Thanks. So I think the timing of this session that we've had this conversation has been um, uh, very appropriate. We're coming into International Justice Week. International Justice Week marks International Justice Day marks the day July 17th in 1998 when the Rome Statute um, uh, was um, affected. Um, and throughout the week, we have a number of events that are looking at international judicial institutions. Um, where they have been successful, where the promise of accountability is still elusive. Um, so firstly, um, on July 18th, we have a webinar and that's going to be held in two sessions. One I will not commend to everybody's attention um, in the North American time zone as I think it will come around 1 a.m. our time, um, but we held this in two sessions to enable uh, greater um, diversity and inclusive, inclusivity um, of our participation. The second though, the second session on July 18th is at 10.30 a.m. And what this will look like um, it, what this will look at and focus on um, are where there are concurrent pathways to justice. So where there are cases before the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, domestic jurisdictions. We talked a little bit about the use of universal jurisdiction. And we're looking at at least one case study of Myanmar. We'll be joined by a Rohingya diaspora member um, and international law experts. Uh, and potentially other case studies, including Ukraine as well. Um, the previous day in hybrid format on July 17th, there is an event that we are co-hosting with the Stimson Center and with the UN Association of the United States of America, among others, and the Alliance for Peace Building um, on the US government's priorities for the summit of the future. Um, anyone in the Washington DC area is very welcome to join me and uh, a colleague in person, but everybody can also uh, tune in online and the links are going into the chat right now. We'll be joined by the Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, Michelle Sisson, um, who will speak to this, what has been hailed as a once in a generation uh, opportunity for UN reform and what the US sees our role in it. Um, also, um, we have opportunities to live stream in the next couple of weeks, events that are going to be at the prep preparatory conference, the PrepCon for the Non-Proliferation Treaty on Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. Uh, that's being held in Geneva and it won't be an engage, uh, a webinar in which you can engage, will only be a live stream. But for those of you, especially who are interested in non-proliferation issues, um, you may wish to check that out. Uh, Dre and James, have I missed anything on our exciting calendar full of activities? That's it. And I would just uh, want to remind everyone the second session uh, for this book to wrap us up is on um, August 10th. And so again, we'll be doing the second half of the, the book, same time, same place. So that's 12 to 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I've put the links to the upcoming book sessions, including this one in the chat. So everyone has access to that, can register. And uh, any questions whatsoever, um, I know many of us are in the Google, the book club Google group. And if you would like to be added to that, if you're not already, please um, feel free. I'm going to put my email in the chat and to reach out to me. So thank you everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Drea. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, of course, uh, if you ever need uh, information about our programming, just go to globalsolutions.org forward slash events. And that's on our website. Uh, you can always get details of what we've got coming up there. Um, and with that, that's the end of today's session. Um, Dr. Emma Onsong, it was a delight. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your considered questions. Um, thank you for all the comments in the chat. Applause there from Rebecca, applause from myself, but I won't make too much noise to drum myself out. Um, see you soon. See you on the 10th of August.